Welcome to the Builders Podcast, episode 68. Matt Campbell, his journey and building a site that attracts 4 million visitors a year. Before we jump into this episode, please subscribe to this podcast if you love business and real stories from the trenches. And after a listen, please give us a thumbs up, like, and share if we've earned it. Hit that notification bell too if you're on YouTube so you don't miss each episode. With your help, we can reach more people and deliver these valuable from the trenches lessons to those that need it. Enjoy the episode. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another The Builders. Uh, This is your host, Matt Levenhagen. Today, I am joined by Matt Campbell, another Matt. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Matt, for having me. I do uh, appreciate it. This is going to be awesome. Yeah, I think it'll be a lot of fun. Uh, So, Matt uh, and I... Of all places, met on Twitter. <laughs> we were introduced on Twitter. Uh, and I, I seem to be doing a lot more on Twitter these days. I don't know how much you've been doing there, Matt, but um, this last year we started spending more time there and have made a lot of great friends. It's a good place. It's definitely better for connections. For my industry, uh, wedding planning, not so much, but uh, for making business connections, it's been yeah. really good. Yeah. That next to LinkedIn. LinkedIn is a good one, too. Definitely. So, uh, so uh, for those of you listening that are new to the builders, uh, generally speaking, as I fir- have a guest on for the first time, we like to dig into their story a little bit, uh, their journey, how they became the wonderful person they are today, and uh, what that journey looked like. And then we'll extract lessons from that, ask questions, you know, see where it takes us. It's all organic. It's not scripted today. Um, and that's about it. And then from there, uh, maybe we'll have him back someday if, you know, he enjoyed his experience and we can dig into some topics specifically, but, um, okay. So for, from that point, let's, uh, I'm going to throw it to you, Matt. Okay. Great name. I'm going to throw it to you. And if you want to, uh, start, you know, just let us know a little bit about yourself and, uh, your origin story a little bit, uh, how you became who you are today and what you are doing. We'll get to that too. All right, I didn't want to go too far back, but uh, so while I was in college, I started a DJ service, Worked, started working for somebody else and said, yeah, I can do better by myself. So started my own DJ service in Montana, DJed in Montana for all, almost all of the 90s. And then uh, this crazy thing called the internet started and uh, met my now wife. Uh, you know, if you were to ask me what's something that something about me that nobody else knows i think a fun fact is my wife and i met in a yahoo chat room back oh wow 1998 that's just a crazy story where you know it wasn't even um you know one of the major platforms now it was actually the yahoo chat room and uh, either she was going to move to montana or i was going to move to vegas so i moved to las vegas didn't want to start the company all over again so I have a business degree, became a purchasing manager of electronic components. And then in 2003, still wanted to get into music and weddings. So then I started Wedding Museum back in 2003. And basically just trying to be everything to everybody. Went back to school, learned PHP and HTML and offered... um, uh, wedding planning sites that they could sign up for. And realized at some point, you know, I'm trying to be everything to everybody competing against the knot and wedding wire and brides. And this is crazy. And looking at the stats that 90% of our traffic, 80 to 90% of our traffic was going to the song list that I created from being a mobile DJ. So rebranded in 2017 to my wedding songs. And that's when things really started taking off. Wow. So that's the backstory. (laughs) <laughs> that is that is uh, that is a backstory. Uh, so you you so you go. We're going all the way back to 2003. When is that the first time you built a website online, or is that did you dabble in that before that at all? Great question. Yeah, I actually had a had a website for my DJ service. Okay, and learned uh, through Dreamweaver and other you know programs back then. Mm-hmm. Uh, in Joomla, I hired somebody to design my website in Joomla, and then 
decided how terrible that was and then converted it all to WordPress at some point. <laughs> at some point. Yeah. Good. WordPress. Good answer. Um, yeah. So, so you had a Joomla site for a while. I know I've, you've had the site for almost 20 years, just shy of 20 years. It's probably gone through a lot of transformations in that time. Did it just start out just in, you started out just as an HTML site or built in Dreamweaver and then it, and you decided CMS is the way to go? Yes. I I wanted something easier than having to edit every single page. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. Having the, li the library in Joomla was fantastic to me where, hey, I could change my footer in one place and it would be changed yeah. everywhere. <laughs> you know, back in the yeah. day, those, those times. And then uh, uh, reached out to another company. They rebuilt it in Joomla. And mm -hmm. I didn't really know much about Joomla, you know, going, thinking back, I should have done WordPress way back then. That was probably, uh, you know, mid two thousands and then eventually converted it to WordPress. I don't know when that was. But. Yeah. But I mean, you, you know, you, you say you wish you would have, uh, done WordPress earlier, but really, mm -hmm. you know, in the two thousands, I was also, I also had some Joomla sites. I actually created some memberships using Joomla, but also WordPress. So I was kind of in both camps, but WordPress wasn't really ready to be a CMS yet in the earlier 2000s. So there's a lot more things that you could do with Joomla was actually a full featured CMS at the time. Uh, so that's why, you know, we'd gravitate to that sometimes depending on the project, but yeah, that's cool. So, so who, so you, number one, how, how did you become a DJ? We're going to rewind a little bit. Uh, okay. how, how did you become a DJ? Is this, were you involved in music and you know, what, why are you inspired by songs and, and being a DJ? Yeah, my uh, I was always into music. My brother was always into to music as well. And then in high school, we had uh, MDA 24-hour dances uh, to raise money for MDA. And okay. whoever was the DJ then, I got behind there and played music and, and just got involved as being a DJ. And so when I went to college, I'm like, hey, you know, this would be a great career. So I reached out to a couple of DJs that in... Uh, in Missoula, Montana, and uh, said, "Hey, are you looking to hire?" They were like, "Yeah," because I had, uh, I got hired. I had all my own music collection, so that really thrilled them because they didn't have to buy the music for me. You know, that's back in cassettes and CDs yeah. were just yeah. starting. So, um, really helped promote him, and then just decided, you know, hey, I could really go out on my own. So my first. First dance was a, it's fine, a, kind of a cool story. It was a uh, end of summer dance that we had in a park. It was a covered tent in, in Missoula called Karis Park. And we invited, we, I had uh, uh, radio ads, all of these things uh, just to promote the dance. And we had over 500 kids show up to this dance. Wow. And my parents back then, we were talking about it the other day. They were probably in their mid fifties, so you know, almost my age now, and they were the ones collecting money as they were coming in. Oh, <laughs> they had nice. nobody else to help, you know. And it was <laughs> had to recruit the parents. Kids, so wow, yeah. So uh, that really got the bug in me to say, oh, that was just a fantastic dance to you know getting that rush of all of those kids singing and dancing yeah. to the songs. So. <sighs> You know, that's, you know, I, I'm listening to you talk. It's like, I, I think back to my early days. You know, I used to have a huge collection of music, you know, CDs, tapes, then the CDs. And, and I just always loved music. And, um, I think, gosh, why didn't I think of becoming a DJ back then? Like, it's like you could have just been, you know, surrounded by music all day long and, and, uh, collecting music. And what, what was your favorite genres or ha is it, has that evolved over the years or? In terms of music, so it definitely uh, '80s hair bands was my favorite, just because that's what I grew up on. Yeah. So, um, but <laughs> you know, I DJed in the '90s, and the '90s, even for parties right now, are really popular because this is when these are the parents of the wedding couple were into the nineties. So it's kind of cool to see all of those, uh, you know, we call the, the, the pop punk bands were really popular. Blink 182. Yeah. Um, 
you know, lit all of those bands that even, you know, the Britney Spears and, and Christina Aguilera, all that music that was popular in the nineties is, is popular now again. So it I should be definitely. because, yeah, I mean, we, when, you know, I saw we're probably roughly the same age in the early fifties. And, and uh, so grew up definitely in the eighties in my teen years, you know, and love the music in that time frame. But then the nineties, I really loved too. I liked get the, you know, grunge and, um, and, you know, your Pearl jams and all, you know, like yeah. all that music. Um, I, I really fell in love with that. I thought, and, and at the time, I don't know how you felt about it. I'm like, wow, music is just, what is the future of music? I mean, this is like, it just felt like everything had led up to this moment and all these amazing creative people were creating all this new type of music that was just never done before. And uh, Soundgarden, all of them, you know, and so I was a little maybe heavier in those. But I also, I yeah. also hung out in, uh, in dance clubs and stuff too. So a lot of dance music and stuff back then too. I enjoy, I enjoy all kinds of genres. But but then after the two in the two thousands and two thousand tens, it just seems like it's all just kind of just just washed. There's there's nothing new or innovative happening. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's, it's funny you say that the dance music that came out then, you know, uh, I, I remember La Boche and CNC music factory and, yeah. and, uh, um, you know, culture beat. I mean, all of these great dance groups that, that were released during the early nineties and, and mid nineties, that music was awesome as a DJ because everybody yeah. was dancing to that. You know, I could play Pearl Jam and nobody would dance where I could play that dance music and everybody would be getting out there. Absolutely. So, yeah. 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 So cool. Yeah. Some music. So then so then you get decided what was the transition though? You were doing DJ and you moved to got married, you moved to Las Vegas. Yep. And you didn't want to start that business over. So you decided to uh well you're doing weddings and stuff probably, so that made sense. Music. My last, yeah, my last dance was the end of the world dance, uh, December thirty first, nineteen ninety nine, when you know the world was going to end because yeah. nobody knew if the computers were going to work. You know, <laughs> January first, two thousand. So I moved the week after that to Vegas, and you know it's one of those things where in Montana you could get away DJing with top forty rock country with those three primarily were mm. moving to a very diverse culture in Vegas. You know, I talked to a lot of DJs in Vegas and they could play anything at any time because, you know, we're the wedding capital of the world. We do 70,000 weddings a, a year in Vegas. Mm. So yeah. it, it just the diversity of music. I just didn't want to start all over again. It, gotcha. I could have worked for somebody else, but yeah. I just didn't want to start all over. And that, and three weeks after I moved here, I found a job. So nice. That was crazy. So for what? A newspaper so, ad. For a newspaper ad. So a job doing what? I was a. Uh, so I have a business degree. So I was as a as an uh, as a buyer. I was hired as a buyer of electronic components for a. Okay. It was a component distributor. So basically, everything inside of the computer we would were buying and selling. Okay. And then what inspired you to build a website and start and the wedding? 2003, stuff? love music, you know, still had that entrepreneurial uh, itch, I guess you could say. So then I started uh, Wedding Museum and I bought Wedding Museum just because it was two words that was nine ninety nine. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, yeah. It was a terrible name. You know, one of my regrets is not changing it earlier, but it is what it is. And... Uh, yeah, yeah. Did you have trouble like uh, promote? Was the traffic more difficult to uh, for that kind of name because it was bringing in oddball stuff and just, it wasn't. Yeah, yeah. That's a great question. You know, even today our homepage isn't in the top ten of our pages, so our traffic really was going to our song lists and our sub pages. Mm -hmm. But as far as branding, I, I thought it would. It, it did all right. You know, it, it, uh, in our high point, we were probably doing 92,000 visitors a month, but one of the downfalls unbeknownst to us is when, uh, 
Panda or Penguin came in and said uh, the duplicate content. And one of the things that we had on our site was lyrics, even though they were legally on there through mm-hmm. Lyric Find. And I was paying them a percentage to show the lyrics. Google came along and said, ah, look at all this duplicate content that you have. And so now instead of 92,000 visitors a month, we're going to give you 30,000 visitors a month. So, uh, that was Gosh. A, oh yeah. God. Yeah, I remember those days. That was rough. I was I was doing SEO back in those days as well, and niche sites, and um, and I, you know, well, first I asked about you know uh, the domain name because that was identified as kind of a really important ranking factor uh, in Google search specifically, which was your main focus normally, Um, and uh, and I remember because I bought so many domains, a lot of nine ninety nine domains or cheaper. Uh, back in those days, and sometimes you just you'd create a dom- you'd you'd buy a domain. It made sense. It seemed like I can build a little brand around this, and uh, you would be surprised by. I don't have a specific example off the top of my head. I should have become. I should have come prepared. But uh, but you'd get these this random like traffic that had nothing to do with what you were actually selling on the page, right. and it was it was always fascinating to me to see what would happen there. Yeah, it's fun to look at the searches to see what what are people searching on my site. Yeah, yeah. To get, even to get ideas. But yeah. like you said, I bought thinkweddingplanning dot com, but I just thought that was too long. Um, so yeah, it's just trying to figure out the way of. Yeah, ha- I mean, is it? Those, um, go ahead. No, so it's not. It's the domain name is important to some degree, but ultimately. Uh, it's everything else that you put into the site and, and the work you do on it and uh, all the other SEO. We're, I don't know if, um, I, you know, the, our audience is going to probably be diverse and some are going to even not even know what we're talking about today. And hopefully the people that stick around uh, care about SEO today a little bit. Uh, but uh, so we're, we're throwing things out like uh, Panda and Penguin and somebody's like, why are we talking about animals all of a sudden? Right. <laughs> <laughs> can you t- can you tell me tell us a little bit about that so while we're on that topic uh like what that means you know what what if that means in the world of search engines so i, I i'm not going to give exact dates but so the panda is about links so when google made an update all of these people were going out uh, and getting links to their website, they're basically votes for your website saying, hey, yeah, this is a legitimate website. So when the pan, what, what they call the Panda update, when that came up, Google said, we're just gonna ignore all of these bad links. So a lot of websites that had these very poor links to their site were dropped from uh, Google Google search, you know, instead of being on page one, maybe they went to page 10 and now they're getting no traffic. And the other one was Panda where it looked at quality of content. And so if you had very poor content or duplicate content on your site, it would drop you in the rankings as well because, you know, Google wants to give you the best results in the, in the search results. So if you had (laughs) poor content, it's no longer going to rank your site. So that's what happened. Well, you know, yeah, so so just sorry, I cut you off, but um, I get excited about this stuff. I don't I don't get to talk to somebody about SEO and stuff every day, uh, but um, it's it's funny though. I remember because I I had I did a lot of SEO. We did pay per click advertising. We did uh, that was actually my core of what I did. Uh, built a lot of niche sites, but I had also friends doing a lot of the same, and we'd build these awesome, you know, very f- focused. Uh, relevant pages that to us seem like this this traffic this keyword here this is the perfect page for that but then Google would have a different idea yeah <laughs> there was a lot of things that there's a lot of changes in those years we now I come from the affiliate just pure affiliate marketing you know we were we, you know we went through so many different things from like when I got started 2003 four um through the early 2010s where you went from you could drive direct traffic to merchants to we need a landing page okay now let's make sure the landing page doesn't have any leaks that was a big thing no leaks on the landing page so we focus this traffic and they click our 
the links that are going to make us money. And then it's like, oh, well, now you got to have a, a better quality score. And it's, it's like those were those were fun days, challenging days. But, yes. Yeah. But but at least you back then you really knew what it took to rank where now it's. Uh, very, very, there's so many factors that are involved now. It's a lot harder to rake. Well, now it's like, you got to worry about uh, social media is like a indicator, right? Uh, and popularity and weird stuff like that. It's hard to measure. Yeah. We had, we had the bars too back then, right? <laughs> we had like, yes. what was it, what was it called? Uh, I can't remember the name of it. It was like, like a rank of 10. Like if you were yeah, the, the one to 10. Page rank, yeah. Yeah, where you can visually see it. Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm glad we've come away from that anyway. Yeah. Well, they they think it got rid of that because people would, like, value their websites based on their page rank. And that was a big part of it. Yeah. And, and they still do through the through the Moz bar, but it, you yeah. know, how accurate is that? So. Yeah. yeah. So, interesting. So, now, so you evolved you got this awesome website you have um uh you went to joomla then you went to wordpress did you find the the change from was the change from joomla to wordpress was that uh smooth for you was that awkward was it difficult because you did you have a lot of content at that time you had to like convert it to a new database and all this stuff or it was, it it? was difficult especially like you were saying the very beginning of wordpress it, it was not very user friendly <laughs> so uh, yeah, it, it was difficult back then. You know, I had probably three, 400 pages back then, mm. maybe 300, um, just because of the different song lists. So yeah, that was difficult. Um, but it's so much easier now with WordPress that, you know, now WordPress runs, I don't know, 40%, whatever that number is. It's a huge number. Yeah, it's over 40%. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was a good choice. I mean, it was there was still some risk there. Luckily, WordPress has gone in the right direction, and um, well, didn't... L- lucky for me, I didn't have much to lose because I was looking at ninety thousand to thirty thousand. I, I had mm. to do something to to bring this around. So right, uh, it was it was good. And then so, the domain. Go ahead. I'm I keep cutting you off. Sorry, I'm just too excited. I'm I'm gonna relax. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you just you just talk. No. So then. Uh, so in 2014, just to give you a little background, in 2014, I said, I need to, if I'm going to run this business, I need to get in the business. And I thought I knew everything about SEO and, you know, I've had my own website. So then in 2014, took a huge pay cut, decided to work for a marketing company, building websites and uh, learning, doing, in, implementing SEO you know, uh, I'd consider one of my mentors, um, Ross Barefoot, he runs, I think he's still the president of the Search Engine Academy. And so mm-hmm. when I got hired, he actually, they have a, a three-day course. So I actually got to do that three-day course. And he really uh, put me in my place that I really don't know SEO. <laughs> uh, if I knew SEO, I'd be getting millions of visitors to this site. You know, that was the reality <laughs> of it. <laughs> So learned a lot about, you know, just making up necessary updates to my site. So that's when I really saw hockey stick uh, growth of when we rebranded to from wedding museum to my wedding songs, because now we have basically what what they call an EMD an exact match domain. So uh, wedding songs is part of the domain. So then we really started ranking for wedding songs and then, um, that's when really, like I said, that's when the growth happened of, uh, you know, implementing that SEO. So now we get over, you know, in every month we, we'd get over, depending on the, the time of the year, we're getting over 300,000 visitors a month. Um, Spectacular. So we're, wow. We're doing 4 million visitors a year. So wow. it's just cr- crazy numbers. So, so you, so that's, that's interesting that, you know, it's like, you don't know what you don't know until somebody's kind of puts you in your place and like, you're doing this all wrong, or you just don't know this part of it, you know? And, <laughs> and sometimes you learn that from working for somebody else for a while. And, and it was the same for me and web design and development. Uh, 
I'm very thankful that I worked for a company for three, four years alongside really smart people and people that had been in the software industry for decades and people and, you know, really, really good programmers and stuff. So it taught me a lot of the fundamentals that I didn't even know I didn't know. And especially the technical stuff that, yeah. you know, your, your site maps and your robots, TXT and, you know, uh, indexability. I mean, just some of the technical stuff. I don't want to get into that with for you, for your listeners, but yeah, just learning that the technical stuff and even the, the easy stuff of how to write a title and description that people will want to click in Google search, you know, you know, just because you may be maybe in position four, doesn't mean you can't get more clicks than position one. If it's better, if it's more clickable. Yeah. So yeah, just learning those sorts of things. Um, that's been very beneficial. And, and they left having me as an employee because I was a sponge saying, hey, I want to learn everything. You yeah. Know, I was a great employee to say, I, because everything I was learning, I was implementing right into it, right into my, into my site or, you know, <laughs> nice. be working on a, a dentist site that, Oh yeah, this worked on this site. I need to be doing that. You know? <laughs> nice. So, nice. You're shaving you off know. lessons and, and applying them to your own site. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So, you know, yeah. and then, and then for their clients too, okay, it's working for the dentist site, my site, we need to be doing this for all of our other clients. Mm. You know, so, uh, yeah. Little- yeah. There's, there's a couple lessons in there. Like the, one of the things that's really cool, uh, again, I use myself as an example just now in web design development, you know, and working with a number of different clients, a number of different websites, you learn one thing in one website. That's the, that's the value to the other clients because now you've learned something, you saw something happen that, that could improve their site. And it's, it kind of feeds on itself. It's very, very cool. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I have a, a long history I had a long history with SEO, but I really, in the last 10 years, I've really kind of ignored it. So um, I've gotten business in other ways or just uh, in social networking and, and uh, networking in general um, and other methods. But um, today, I mean, is it is it a lot different than it was 10 years ago? Is it, uh, I mean, it, like if somebody's starting with a new business, new website today, um, and they want to, uh, and they're thinking about, well, what should I focus on? Should I just focus on social media? Should I do S worry about SEO? Should I worry about, uh, doing all these other things that you could do advertising, paid advertising? I mean, uh, what is, and what is the investment of that is because obviously there's a difference between advertising and, and SEO and that SEO takes time. Well, you can invest money and help getting help from others, but what are your thoughts on that? So my background is the blogger. So I'm actually the organizer of the Las Vegas bloggers meetup. And we, we had a meeting last night and this, this exact question came up last night. Nice. And if I started over again today, so I'm just looking at a blogger's perspective that Mm -hmm. you have to start out with at least 100 authoritative articles. Oh, and that should be your goal just to get, to become an authority in your space. And so when you say, when I say that, even if you write three articles a week, which is extremely difficult because we're talking probably around 2000 words a piece, it's going to take you eight months to do. So if even at, you know, one article a month, you're talking two years or one article a week, you're talking two years just to build that up. So I would say building your authority, in your space and then also building your authority as a as a writer and also as a brand you know that's one of the downfalls about my wedding songs it's a terrible name to kind of brand um but definitely working with you know pr companies there's hero there's uh i'm fortunate that there's in the wedding space there's actually a pr company that helps authors and businesses get published in in authoritative um, magazines and mm. websites yeah. but another way you know it's it's against google google's rules but you can also get sponsor posts on these as well we're just getting the mention on a very authoritative site 
you know, even for for your, yourself, maybe you get published on moz.com or get published on Search Engine Roundtable, you know, just getting published in those in those spaces, even without a link, just getting mentioned, uh, just builds your authority as, as a brand and an author. And I think that that's really important nowadays uh, to get to get your to become an authority in your space. Yeah. And and uh, one second here. Oh, that's not going to work. I have I have Alexa behind me. Now it's going to start flashing. Oh, there we go. OK. Um, <laughs> notification. It's going to be a little distracting. Um, so, uh, yeah, so it, that's interesting. So, um, cause one of the, so I, I like the idea. Number one, I love the hundred. I, I love that number. Um, because it, it gives people a goal. It gives them something to focus on and around that building authority and, and saying things like a couple thousand words and uh, the size of the articles matter um, and, and stuff like that kind of gives somebody a framework to kind of uh, shoot for. And yeah. I know I've fallen short. I, I started a blog, but I, I don't have a lot. My excuse is I don't have time, but, uh, <laughs> but I know that that's probably why I'm not seeing the success I am. I focused a little bit on on page, not much on off page. Um, and there's there's a difference there, but reason why I like the number is because when I was back back in the day when I was doing pay per click advertising, I had a method called you've been around for a while, maybe you've heard of it, campaign blasts, the campaign yes. blast method. Yes. Do you remember that? Uh, I've heard it a few times. Yes. Yeah. So I was the author of that. I I the blast formula, campaign blasting. Um. And so I had wrote, I wrote the ebook. I had the memberships. Uh, we had a campaign blast membership and other memberships. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the reason I tell you that though, is because uh, our, in our forums, we would have these, what I would call blast challenges. And the way I set them up is, you know, you're, and, and no, I'm not gonna get into all about what blasting was all about, but it was basically about testing markets uh, in a very specific manner, uh, cheaply, uh, uh, testing a lot of merchant product combinations and stuff until, and then, uh, and we would be like in these blast challenges, we're going to, we're going to launch a hundred campaigns. And that was our number. And I, but I figured out that number, if, if somebody was committed to it and they went through with that, they would always find success. They would always find niches that made money. And then our thing was, you know, then you identify those and then you scale them up. And, um, but I, that's why I like that number. So, um, and, and it gives you, you know, when you're writing, your first articles are going to be terrible. Your next yeah. ones are going to be, so it gives you that perspective of, okay, now I know how to write. And then also, um, as you're writing, you'll figure out your niche. So there was people last night that were like, I'm going to be a travel blogger. Well, that's really broad. You know, as you write, you're going to figure out, okay, are you going to, are you going to be how to travel under $5,000 or, you know, are you going to be a budget traveler? Are you going to describe mm. uh, the beaches? You know, you're going to figure out what direction you're going to take. And uh, w one of the very popular questions, I know your listeners are wondering how many words you're saying a couple thousand. My answer to that is the number of words is enough to answer the question. So one of the things we did last night was we Googled, um, uh, motive. I can't, I can't remember what it was. Motivational, um, risk taking so, something along those lines. And we looked at the number one result, put, put it into word counter and there was 2,500 words. So then you could set, okay, the number one result is 2,500 words. That's what you're competing against. So your 300 word article potentially is not going to rank number one because number one is 2,500 words. <laughs> so it just gives you that guideline of, of how many words, um, how many words it's going to take to, to rank that at the one number one position. That's interesting. Yeah. So look at what your competition or for that particular topic is and emulate that or do better. Correct. That's, that's yeah. cool. Do, do without, you use any, fluff. <laughs> what's that? Without fluff? Without fluff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just uh, throwing whatever in there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Um, 
Do you, are, are there any tool, uh, tools that you use to help you also do, like topic wise to choose topics um, for even if you are niched down enough? I mean, how do you do you use anything? I know there's a bunch of tools out there. Uh, and we used to use them uh, when we cared about SEO, which we will hopefully someday again. Uh, but uh, but yeah, what do you use? Great, great question. So for topic wise, I hate paying money, so I don't pay money to find keywords. Uh, there's I'm just using Google and uh, hmm. I'm using so in order to f complete. So today I was updating uh recessional songs for a wedding so i'm googling recessional songs and then i'm looking at the people also ask section within google and then i'm answering those questions inside of the article so that's how i'm finding a lot of the topics to include in the article but if i want topic ideas i usually go to answer the public.com i'll throw it in there and they'll give you you know hundreds of article ideas that uh, people my thing is I don't want to write about uh, um, things that people aren't searching for so answer the public is a great idea if I really want to get intense then I'll use the, uh, the Google Ads keyword planner mm -hmm. just so yeah. I can get an idea of, of uh, you know Vo volume or whatever it is. Yeah. exactly volume oh, that's a that's great advice that's fantastic advice you know what and uh, again, myself as an example. So mattlevenhagen.com, small little blog. I wrote, I was writing like an article a week for a little while last year and haven't in like four or five months. So it's not like my biggest focus. Um, I know all the stuff I need. I, you know, like I all know all the advice that you would give a blogger, but blogging just hasn't been my focus. Um, sure. But one of the things <laughs> that I tend to do uh, blogging wise is I would just like, this is a topic I'm interested in. I just choose it randomly and I just start writing on it. Sure. And then I just try to choose some keyword, you know, like a, a good, uh, title that is catchy and a good hook. And then there, um, I don't know, almost don't even worry about this, <laughs> like search engines or doing that research yeah. beyond that. I think I've used, I tried using a tool for a little while to come up with, you know, topic ideas and stuff. But nothing, you know, nothing major there. But, uh, it's, but I love, I always love that idea of going out and seeing what, uh, and that can be applied to many things. See what people are having problems with or asking questions about, and uh, even if you're developing a product, creating a product to solve that problem, or if you create an article, create an article to solve that problem. It's kind of the same thing. Correct. It it has to be yeah. a benefit to the reader. Uh, that, that's one of the things that I stress because, it, it, you know, this w one of the things is okay. I'm looking for recessional songs. You have you you only have their attention for so many for so long. So one of the things that I realized about a year ago is okay. I have this huge list, a hundred recessional songs as an example. Why don't I put at the very top? Here's our top ten songs. So that way. I'm giving them the answer. It's the benefit. And then if they want to, most people will continue and read the rest of the list. If they, if they don't think, if they think those top five are terrible, then yeah, they're going to leave. But yeah. it's kind of like the same as, as a recipe blog. You know, a lot of that recipe is always at the bottom. Why not have a link at the top says jump to recipe? Because then that way they can, it, it's a resource. They can skip all of that, all of that fluff of, of uh, you know what not to do to you know don't burn your food tips. Yeah. Sorry. Are you so so? This is, a, this is a question I have to ask you. Like, how how would how do you monetize your your blog? Um, are you is it mostly affiliate marketing? Is it uh, other ways? So I'm going to give you a little story about that. So most people when they when they start a blog they will monetize their site from Google AdSense. So basically part of uh, Google's platform, you'll put their ads on there on your website and you'll make, let's say an average of, let's say $3 per thousand visitors. And so you grow your site, you're getting now thousands of visitors to your site a month. And then the progression for me was to go to Ezoic, which is another ad 
network, but now instead of making three dollars a month, maybe depending on your niche, you know, financial, you're going to make a lot more. Uh, travel bloggers uh, may make a little bit less than that, so it depends on your your industry. But now maybe let's say you're making thirteen dollars a month, and then my progression from there is to MediaVine, where just to be on that platform, you have to have fifty thousand sessions a month. And then, so now you're going to even jump up farther uh, and even higher than that. It depends on your industry where financial, you know, uh, financial tips, they could be making $50 per thousand visitors. Just it really depends on the industry that you're in. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I'm monetizing my site through advertisements that's managed through the Mediavine platform. And if you're, if you're getting over 50,000 sessions, highly recommend uh, Mediavine, just the community uh, in in Facebook, people are honest. They give you your feedback. You can ask, ask a question like newsletters and everybody are hosting and everybody will give you their opinions. Um, and so that's one avenue. And another avenue is through the Amazon uh, uh, affiliate because they're the gorilla in the room. You know, somebody could click on a song, I'm going to make two cents, but maybe there's other things in their cart mm. that they have because 40% yeah. of all online purchases are done through Amazon. So, yes, there could potentially be something else in their cart, and then we're going to get a percentage of that sale as well. Yeah, they're really good at upselling and cross-selling and all that good stuff. So, yeah, I don't know if everyone realizes that with Amazon. Yeah, you don't – it's not just – they can click on – your ad, but you could get uh, right. credit for anything they buy in a, in a time frame. What is it like 90 days or something, 60 days? Uh, for me, it's within, so you get more time if you send them directly to the cart. But for me, the user experience is, is terrible because I don't want them to go buy a 99 cent song. Then mm. I make two cents. So yeah. uh, for me, I want to send them to the actual product. So for me, it's a 24 hour turnaround. But like you said, there could, you know, I can give examples of, yeah, there was a tag Hoyer watch that they purchased along with that song. So yeah, that $1,200 watch, we just made, you know, 40 bucks or whatever it was yeah. uh, from, from that purchase. So. Amazon is amazing too because they have such a. Obviously, they sell everything, so it's really easy to find your thing. Even even on my blog, the little I've done, I just naturally look for affiliate programs. I do you know straight affiliate programs or whatever. And but Amazon's one of them because oh, I might be talking about a book one day. I talk about books a lot, and that's an easy one. Um, but uh, yeah, so I mean, do you? So uh, what is it called? Media, media, media buying. I haven't used it. Is it more like, is that like a feed? Do they manage what is shown? Or is it, or is it like, or is it an affiliate network like, and you choose what you want promoted or is, how does that work? That's a great question. This is a good education for everybody that wants to get in that space. So <laughs> I'm just, what yeah. no, that, that's awesome. Yeah. I, I, cause yeah. that's something I don't cover very much. Um, so what, what they do is they'll go out to, let's say, Target or Macy's or, you know, who, whoever it is, all these people, and they'll negotiate uh, everything for you. So they'll, they'll go to Target and they say, we're, you give us a million dollars and we're going to give you a, whatever the, the ratio is. We're going to give you, a, you know, 10 billion eyeballs for that million mm. dollars, whatever that is. So gotcha. then, what they do is they distribute between all of their uh, all of their um, publishers, and they'll say, "Okay, we're going to give you a percentage of all this based on how many eyeballs you're giving to the ads." But for in return, we're negotiating all that depending on the number of visitors. We're going to keep twenty five percent or twenty percent, depending on on the how many visitors that you get. Of course, the more visitors you get, the, the more money you're going to make as a publisher. But let's say Mediavine keeps 25% and then the publisher gets 75%. So that's why the that revenue is a lot higher than AdSense and, and other ad networks. But the thing is, is that like you're saying, can you choose your ads? No, I can't choose my ads, but I can say I don't want, 
By category, I don't want any political ads or I don't want any ads about drugs or alcohol or I don't want ads. But just keep in mind when you do that, you're because those are highly sought, sought after, your ad revenue could go down. <laughs> mm, yeah. So, but for me, it's more important not to have political ads on a wedding site. So I would rather make less and have it more, um, hi, more highly targeted ads than to have those make more money from political ads. Good stuff. I, I, yeah. I'm conscious of time here. I'm going to ask you sure. something else here that I, I have to know today. Um, okay. myself as a fan, <laughs> as a new fan of yours. Um, okay. It, so, so on the, uh, and just one more thing about SEO, then we'll kind of, uh, you know, wrap things up here. Um, sure. uh, otherwise, um, but one of the things that is very popular and you see this, even on social media, you see, uh, ads and they link off to a website and there's like, you can't even get to the content through the ads on that site. It's, it's a horrible experience. Um, they're obviously making money because they wouldn't be doing it otherwise. Um, it, what are your thoughts about uh, that model where you just, your whole goal is just to get the eyeballs on your site and hope that somebody clicks something and buys something or just click something um, versus having a more uh, user-friendly site where you care about the content, you care about the user experience, you care about adding value. You know, what, what are your thoughts around that? You know, those two models. It, boy, that's a great question. Uh, I struggle with that all the time where e even I'll go to the site sometimes. Actually, I did this last week and I'm like, man, there's a lot of ads. <laughs> what I, I, I can still see the content. I mean, we all get blindness from all of the ads. And mm -hmm. even myself, I lowered the number of ads last week. And yeah, revenue did go down a little bit. Um, I would love to get to the point to say, yeah, we're getting a, th a million visitors a month and I'm going to reduce the number of, of ads on there. But you yeah. know, I have to wager, okay, can I pay the bills? Cause when you're getting all that traffic, yeah, it's mm. more for hosting. It's, it's true. You know, all the expenses are more. So yeah, I got to be able to pay my bills as well. Uh, so I, I love the model as a business owner because I'm making money as I sleep. Yeah, but at right. the same time, it's not passive income because if I'm not making updates, if I'm not making new content, then I'm not growing. So yeah, yeah it's uh, um, uh, I I love the model to say just because I I don't have a customer that I that I have to um, manage. I guess yeah. you could say. Yeah. It, well, yeah. I, I love. I, that's why I love. Fell in love with affiliate marketing myself. Um, kind of wish some, some days, some days, I wish it was still the olden days. Um, but well, it's interesting. I kind of, I kind of asked that. Cause I mean, I, I think it's, it sounds like, and correct me if I'm wrong. So it sounds like, like way back in the day, let's go back. I go back a lot. Um, mm -hmm. pop-ups were like, I'll never use a pop-up. I don't want to affect the user experience. I don't want to, you know, I just don't like them myself. I go to a website, I see a pop-up, I click away. I, and then you test them. Yes. And you realize that you get 10 times the signups that you got without it, with it just in line or something. And it's probably the same way with ads where you're like, yeah, I care about the user experience, but at the same time, I tested this this number of ads and I'm getting, making more money. Um, that's probably kind of plays into it a little bit. I would imagine. So I, I used a program that I love called mail Munch promo uh, shout. I'm not getting paid for that, for that shout out to them, but <laughs> I love their pop-up. I had a ton of signups, but exactly what you're saying. User experience is terrible. It's like, okay, I have had, I have ads and a pop-up. This is terrible. So what I did is I created a lead magnet of, you can download the top 100 winning songs. You give me your email, I'm gonna give you this PDF of the top 100 winning songs. So at least I know they're interested in me. And then I also have our newsletter sign up and we get over 100 
uh, email subscribers a month. So for me, okay, it may not be 250 for mail much with the annoying pop up, but at least I know these are people that are interested in what we're doing and, and following yeah. the journey. Yeah. So let's, let's kind of end on a couple things, a couple things. I, I was going to say one thing, but, uh, so it, I mean, obviously, this is working great for you. I mean, do you see yourself doing this, just continuing down this path the next five, 10 years, or do you have plans to scale things up, maybe start a new website and duplicate your efforts there? And uh, do you have do you have any plans or, or are you good to go? You're just managing what you got. That is a great question. So I don't know the future of blogging just because it's informational. Mm -hmm. So I've already started a new website because on a blog, you cannot save your songs. You cannot create playlists. So I created a new website called Top Wedding Songs where it's similar to Spotify, but only wedding songs. So you can create your own playlist and you can listen to the songs. As a developer, you could appreciate this. We use the API to YouTube so that now they just play the video f from YouTube and now they can at least hear the song. Nice. Uh, nice. So that's our uh, working on growing that um, because I you're think all going to be the future. Okay. And are you, you're also teaching too, right? It sounds like you're, are you, uh, do you plan to coach people or write a book or do anything like that? Or have you? I so I'm the organizer of the Las Vegas bloggers meetup. I just mm -hmm. I, for the last two and a half years shared my knowledge that I've I've learned. My my book is on wedding songs, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> it, it, it's it's tricky because I know SEO. Then people think about me as yeah you know, I'm I'm speaking on SEO on an upcoming uh, DJ convention, but are they going to think of me as SEO and want to hire me as SEO? Or mm. are they going to think of me as wedding songs? So that's the dilemma that I have. Mm. Well, yeah. moving forward, probably not. Um, okay. I'm going to share my story as more inspirational than. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Good. Yeah. You get, that's the decision you got to make. I mean, it's the same. Like I, again, back in the day, like I could have very easily just continued to build my affiliate business and just focus on that. And I decided I like teaching people and talking to people and obviously, uh, and, and so that's my thing. So, um, it's, it's, that's a tough, it's kind of like same way with, uh, you know, programming and stuff. Do you want to be a programmer? You want to eventually manage a team? You know, those decisions always have to be uh, taken into consideration. Okay. So the other last thing, um, that I wanted to just say. Uh, so with, and, and I'm kind of jumping a little bit around, but um, blogging still hot. Is blogging still, is it still like, because with social media and everything, it just feels like a lot of people are, are you know, like blogging's dead, but it's obviously not. Or is it depending on the niche or whatever? Um, are more people doing social media content or YouTube, you know, video or, you know, on other third party? Or is blogging still a lot of people blogging and being successful with it? So my thing is about blogging is you own the content. And that is a huge thing for me, you know, it's not on what happens if Instagram says we're shutting down, what happens if TikTok says we're only going to be in China, all of that content you created is gone. So I really like the idea of the blog first. And then like we were saying, exactly what you're doing, doing a podcast, I have a podcast too. I have a, a, a YouTube channel as well. So I think it's important to be out in other areas. I would rather see somebody be great at one other platform or maximum two other platforms than trying to be great at everything. I hate Instagram. I hate Facebook. I hate uh, Twitter other than the relationships uh, because my it's it's just a, a pain in the butt where I'd rather do a podcast and get, you know, um, you know, yeah. 50 people a day listening. Yeah. So. Nice. All right. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to stop asking you questions now. Okay. 
we, we'll save the other <laughs> stuff for another time. Yeah, another time. Uh, I would love to have you back sometime. Uh, gr- great having you. Thanks for joining me today, Matt. Uh, I, I th- Thanks for having me, Matt. <laughs> you, you bet. All right, take her easy. Thanks, everyone. Till next time. That's all for today's episode. I hope you enjoyed that. Again, please subscribe if you haven't already and give us a thumbs up if we deserve it. If you want to comment on this episode's page, provide me with requests on topics for future episodes, or inquire about being a guest, please find your way to thebuilders.fm. You can contact me there or add a comment under these show notes. Now a word from our sponsor, my agency, Unified Web Design. We build custom websites, features, we maintain websites, we work with agencies to fulfill their web design and development needs, and more. If you're interested in our services or are looking for an agency to work with as a partner to build awesome sites for your clients, feel free to reach out to me at unifiedwebdesign.com. There's a handy contact me link at the top, fill out that form and it will open a ticket and that ticket will find its way to me. Thanks for joining me today. We'll see you next time.